is the closed open string map for the Russia and Okay. Uh, <coughs> Th th thank you very much uh, for having me. So th this is a talk about uh, Fukaya categories of Lefschetz fibrations. So in fact, the Lefschetz non-degeneracy condition is not so important as so Fukaya categories of, of lambda ginsburg models in some sense. Now, I'm pretty sure there's lots of people in this room who are thinking, not again, Paul. You know, well, why can't you just let this go? And it, it's really true. My, my relationship with that subject is you know, like a divorced couple with kids. <laughs> so my partner has gone on to go many, do many exciting things in a new life, but you know, we still have to sort out certain ongoing issues, right? And moreover, this is a pretty basic talk, so it's more like, you know, the kids are now in high school, but I finally figured out how to put together the crib that your sister gave us. <laughs> um, by the way, this, this is a metaphor. <laughs> Okay, excellent. So, um, <laughs> so, um, so, what do we do? Uh, I need something black. Yeah, there we go. Uh, so, so I'm, I'm looking at this situation here, right? And um, so, E is a is a supply manifold okay and um, so exactly what kind you know I will leave up to you you're an expert maybe if you're <coughs> a scared person like me you want to say uh, it's an exact symplectic manifold but anyway uh, the main thing that we want is this is some kind of vibration with singularities and uh, uh, outside um, a compact subset of the base Um, pi is a locally trivial <coughs> uh, So basically there's some compact subset of the base in which something bad happens and whatever happens will cause monodromy um, around the large circle but apart from that monodromy there is no more structure out there at infinity. Okay. So, um, so the way that you build this theory is uh, usually you first of all uh, pick a direction in the complex plane, which uh, for me, uh, for convenience reasons, will be the direction minus i infinity. So, so let's consider. So this guy here, this is a function minus the imaginary part of i. Um, it's Hamiltonian vector field. vector field uh, x, h, and <coughs> it's called th. Okay. So then um, outside a compact subset of the base So obviously you know that the flow preserves h, so it preserves the imaginary part of the map pi. But since it's it's a sort of a such a locally a, a product, you know it will just move things horizontally at unit speed. Okay. So this is a so um, the way we can use this Hamiltonian is to remove intersection points at infinity. So um, so for example, the, the simplest example would be there is the I don't know what, we're going to call it vanishing cohomology of this thing, which is the basic topological invariant, which is the, the um, homology or cohomology relative to a fiber at infinity. So you place the fiber somewhere far out, but of course you have to make a decision where is the far out, and in this case here, it's all the way down. Okay? So, um, so when you do this kind of curve categories, your basic choice is first of all what kind of objects you pick, so we allow You know, again, they might have some technical assumptions, but I'm not worried. If you, you know, you take care of this. Um, uh, so many folks. Um, so Lagrange has many folks uh, L in E, such that pi of L is um, so it's so it's so if you project them down. 
you get a, a compact subset, could be anything, but then when they go to infinity, they're only allowed to go to infinity. Um, sorry, along some line um, where the you know that goes down some vertical line going down. Okay. So um, so then the, so everybody agrees on this, and then we agree on what the morphism spaces should be in this Fukaya category, at least on the cohomology level. Okay. So the morphism spaces. in uh, f of pi, okay? Which is, so you have a, obviously it's a, it's a chain complex, um, but it's cohomology, slightly easier, so it's the uh, flow cohomology, measuring the intersections of this, but where um, I perturb by um, this Hamiltonian here, which means that it's just, it measures the intersection of the first one, um, moved by this Hamiltonian, okay. where alpha is bigger than uh, lambda 0 minus lambda 1. Lambda 0, lambda 1 are the, the horizontal lines of these things. Okay. And uh, um, so this is, uh, it looks like this. So you have, uh, this is L0, this is L1, and then you put a and you form phi h alpha of alpha. Okay. So, um, and so this gives you the morphism spaces, then you need all the composition laws, and uh, this is a kind of TQFT, so the compositions are given by, um, so this is what I mean by removing intersection points at infinity. When you have these two things, you know, you need to think about what, how you're gonna count the intersection points line somewhere in the fibers down there, and the way that you do it is, yes, you perturb here. It's unsymmetric, so if we started with L1, there would be no intersection points as I've drawn them. There, there would be no morphisms, okay? And so the um, so operations, so the composition and the you know, A infinity operations um, <coughs> are defined using um, <coughs> Surfaces, okay, with boundary. So S. So this is this is an example of a surface. Surfaces S, okay. So together with. Um, now I, I need somehow to measure this amount of perturbation here. Say so one form on my surface. It's a real one form, uh, which is closed and uh, vanishes on the boundary. So and there are particular kinds of. Okay, so I draw a picture. of this Riemann surface. So this part of the Riemann surface is sort of the ends, and they have uh, distinguished parameters, s this way and t the other way. And uh, so here you want this somehow uh, to be a constant, alpha 0 dt, a is alpha 1 dt, a is alpha d dt. Okay, and uh, the, the uh, boundary components are labeled with your Lagrangian submanifolds. And uh, these constants, uh, uh, alphas, um, are the same are constants that you used uh, to form the morphism spaces, right? So clearly, in this situation here, um, alpha zero is equals alpha one plus plus alpha d. Okay. So for instance, um, but these are still disks. Excuse me, these are genus zero, I'm, I'm trying to, I mean, everything here you've seen before. I'm trying to make a point here. The point I'm trying to make, so if you take a single Lagrangian submanifold, uh, LL, um, times alpha H, and you look at its composition here, so this is, it has two, this is LLL, and there are two negative ends here, uh, two, two ends to the right, and by the way, my, my compositions usually go this way. Um, for reasons that I know. Okay. And then you end up in two alpha h, which is not a good idea because you were trying to make this one here as a ray, into a ray. Okay. Well, we're not too troubled about this. Um, so what happens is, so one can also allow, allow uh, instead of saying it's closed, so this is a Riemann surface, so it's oriented, you can allow um, 
this to be sort of subclosed. That doesn't really help because it makes this one here even bigger, uh, the output. Um, and this leads So you can, you can um, you know, if I'm just looking at, um, at a strip, okay, um, so you can have A is equals alpha 1 dt, A is equals alpha 0 dt. Um, and so this gives you a map from the flow cohomology of um, L0, L1, alpha 0, and uh, to H of star L0, L1, alpha 1. And if you take those, as you can easily see, so first I, I sort of perturb, then I perturb even more, because the intersection don't really change, and this one here is an isomorphism. Okay. So then, um, you know, assuming, of course, that alpha 0 and alpha 1 both satisfy this original inequality here. Okay. And so in particular here, for this example here, you would have this map. Um, and uh, so there's the, this map in this direction, and it's an isomorphism. So to make the actual ring structure on morphism spaces, you take this composition here, mm -hmm. and then you invert this one here. Okay. So um, of course, what you really have to do um, is to construct a chain level structure, right? So this is on the chain level. This could, uh, is maybe, uh, you know, well, I think it's reasonable to say it's a quasi-isomorphism. You don't try to force it, because even if you've tried forcing it to be an isomorphism, you'll be unhappy with the results. Um, and so there's a certain inversion of quasi-isomorphism that's built into the foundations. Now, luckily for us, you know, the main thing that people have done in the last 50 years in homological algebra is inverting quasi-isomorphisms. So um, it is not actually a problem. And you have to check that when you invert these things, you don't acquire any other undesired um, extra morphisms. But you know, that's what the homological algebra is for. And this is one of the ways that things are typically done. But it is slightly bothersome, because this inversion of quasi isomorphisms you have to sort of carry them along on anything that you build on top of them. So the other thing that um, I wanted to look at here is a closed open string maps. Okay? So um, you know, as soon as these, these um, categories had been introduced, um, I think probably by Maxime, even though that was a bit before my time. Um, you know, people started looking at, at their homological invariants, their Hochschild homology and Hochschild cohomology, and what those might correspond to. And for Hochschild cohomology, it's not exactly a, a classical topological invariant. So, so you have the Hochschild cohomology of this um, Kaya category that we constructed, and uh, there's a map from the ordinary cohomology of the total space, but it's not an isomorphism except in special cases. So instead, what happens is there is a, another group which comes with a map here, and uh, this one here <coughs> is actually, so rho is uh, an automorphism. <coughs> E and H F star of rho is, is its fixed point flow cohomology. Okay. And this is actually the closed open map. Um, and it's, you know, you can conjecture and in some cases, some cases prove okay, that it's an atom. Um, I think if you go like in complete generality, like I have stated it, um, you will have a bit of a hard time proving that's an isomorphism due to the difficulty of constructing objects um, in the category concretely. But for Lefschetz federations, I think you, you know, it's probably within the convex hull of sort of you know Shields' work. Um, okay, so so let me explain to you. So in particular, let's see. So Hochschild cohomology is maybe kind of complicated, but remember that the Hochschild cohomology uh, maps to the morphism spaces and the morphisms of any object. So there's a and this map we ought to be able to understand. Okay. This, this is like the first piece of the uh, open closed string. 
So let me describe to you what this um, So rho Okay, so the way that this works is uh, so what do I mean? So um, so the full rotation is something. So here you have some blob in the middle where um, there are singular fibers and you don't know what to do. But outside, you can make a map which sort of starts rotating these things more and more until it finally rotates by 2 pi. Okay? And so outside this uh, outside uh, compact subset, it then maps every fiber to itself. And in every fiber, it is actually the mono global monodromy map. Okay? And you compose this with um, some kind of translation, which is, um, which is given by you know, phi h, uh, I think, big T for some T, uh, not the problem. OK? So uh, sorry, this should be for some T. So, <coughs> so originally, if you just use this one here, the, the fixed point set um, is uh, non-compact. Uh, because it has, uh, every fiber is fixed, but now when you decompose it with this, then all the fibers at infinity will be shifted slightly, and uh, there will be a compact fixed point set leading to a well-defined uh, fixed point flow homology. So uh, just as a sanity check, if it was a completely trivial vibration, you know, this one here is um, Hamiltonian isotopic to the identity just by rotating everything even inside, and then after translation, you wouldn't have any fixed points, and that would vanish. So if you have no singularities, well, the category is zero, and this is also zero. So good. So, <coughs> so the natural uh, closed open string map in flow cohomology is the following thing. So you have a any subjective morphism and you map it to <coughs> Okay, this one here. Okay, so this is uh, geometrically this is induced by well, a, a disk with a puncture, or if you like this, you know, an open string output and a closed string input. Okay. So um, so this is the Lagrangian flow cohomology. So now if if we choose, so remember here I've been kind of cagey about what the sign of big T is, okay? So if we choose um, big T less or equal to zero, then let's see what happens. So you have the, <coughs> the flow cohomology of rho of L, L, okay? So let's see. So this is my, uh, This is my L. And then what you're supposed to do is uh, I make, uh, as it goes out, it acquires a full rotation, but then it's translated slightly to the left. So that's rho of L. Okay. Um, and I remind you that when we define the morphism space, um, I had L, and I would do something like this. Phi. T of L, T is bigger than zero. Okay. Okay. So basically, there is a. So this is what define the uh, morphism spaces. H of star. Sorry. Okay. L, L, alpha. I should call this alpha. Okay. And so it's like you know you first you you take this L and you displace it to the right. And then you start moving it around and around and around and around, and you come back here. But actually, you didn't actually add any new intersection points, right? So you go off to infinity in that direction, or you go to infinity here, but it never meets its original thing again. So in fact, there is a map here, another of those continuation maps, which is an isomorphism. OK? And so to, so, um,
So to get the actual closed open map for the category, um, you do something like this, that you go, so you have the flow cohomology of rho, it goes to the flow cohomology of rho of L, comma L, and then there's this one here, which is the actual morphism space. There's a map here, it's an isomorphism, and, okay, so this is the first piece. Okay. So basically, you know, this, this perturbation which we did by moving things to the right is equivalent to you know, wrapping ones around and moving sort of far to the left. Okay. So in a more uh, you know educated versions, you would say that you know first you get a closed open map which does not actually land in the uh, um, Hochschild cohomology, but it lands in the Hochschild cohomology with coefficients in some bimodule, which is associated to this automorphism row, the graph bimodule. And then you prove that if you set things up really carefully, you can achieve that that graph bimodule is actually as more than the value model. Okay. Um, so, uh, okay, so this look, this situation was sort of the same one as before, where I had to define this, I had to invert something. Um, now this one here is a very serious obstruction to understanding things, okay? So um, I should say that um, this has anyway been slightly puzzling, right? Really you would want to say that this is the identity and, you know, as you can see from these arguments, it is in some sense the identity, but so there's been, uh, you know, I think that the breakthrough in understanding why it's okay to, to, to consider this as the identity came, uh, you know, in work of uh, Abu Zaid uh, and Kanatra. Okay. So in particular, <coughs> we showed how, I mean, you remind me that this thing here is a gerson hammer algebra. It is not a BV algebra because the category is not uh, close by the R category. Um, so, so this carries a, a product and a bracket, and uh, so Abu Zaid and Ganatra showed how to endow this one here with a product, uh, which is totally you know, obvious. And then you, you think, well, it should be a standard kind of TQFT type argument um, to show that this map here is compatible with the product and the bracket, and everything is well behaved. And you know, somehow, if your house is built on sand, there'll be a certain maximum height to build. And as far as I'm concerned, this is the maximum height. So, you know, that framework here really does not work well for thinking about closed open stream maps. And closed open stream maps are kind of important, you know, for instance, because we, we got very good at computing this, this Kaya category, so uh, we also got very good at computing, and therefore the print structure and, and the bracket of this are easy to compute. These ones are kind of hard to compute, so um, it would be very nice to figure this out. Okay, so this is the problem that I am going to talk today so far uh, in a kind of classic uh, habit for myself, I have done nothing except complain. <laughs> Are there any questions? Excuse me? Well, because, you know, for instance, they include mirrors to Thanos or something, right? right? So it, it's really not. Um, okay. <laughs> Um, well, it's again, it's some kind of uh, you know continuation map. So you sort of you know you, you, you start moving. Um, start with the usual cohomology is is the cohomology of a small rotation. Okay, and then you, you start rotating more and more, and this one doesn't really make a, a big difference. Okay. Um, okay. Um, what's the time? Okay. Good. All right, so the, um, I would like to summarize the situation as follows. So in the definition um, of the Kaya category, we used, um, you know, just, just consider the geometry of the base. After all, that's what's the only thing that I really use, the geometry of the complex plane. So to define the uh, actual Fukaya category, I use the distinguished direction minus I infinity, and I use the one parameter subgroup of the uh, automorphism of the plane, which is simply left and right translation. And um, to define the open closed string map, um, I actually had to sort of, you know, things no longer actually preserve this direction at infinity because I started rotating out. 
Okay, so I you could argue that I used uh, you know the the subgroup that's given by translations and by by uh, Euclidean rotations, and the fact that it's non-abelian is actually kind of crucial in order to be able to. So this automorphism is not obtained as a flow of a time-independent Hamiltonian. It's not autonomous because if it were autonomous, its flow homology would carry a BD operator, which it really doesn't. Okay, so what do we do? So the first thing to do um, is really stupid, okay? So let's take the base to be the upper half plane. Okay. And so the Lagrangian submanifolds, so instead of C, right? So the Lagrangian submanifolds satisfy. Now, uh, you know, just to make it clear, it's still the same thing as before, but you know, in this picture it appears. Okay, pi of L is compact union a set where the real part is lambda and uh, the imaginary part uh, is one. Okay, so but before they went to much less than one. So, but before they went to minus infinity, they simply go uh, and approach the, the, the boundary of the upper half plane. Okay? And so, um, so instead of horizontal translations, um, we use horizontal translations um, and expansions. So affine transformations of the upper half plane. Affine transformations of the upper half plane. <laughs> okay, well, why, why couldn't I have used affine transformations before? Well, I could, it's slightly less convenient. The nice thing about this is that um, so these are, but you know, that again depends on your resistance. Um, so these are symplectic with respect to the hyperbolic metric. Right? I mean, the hyperbolic metric and its associated area form, and they, they are in fact isometries. So, so that makes it very easy. You know. So what do I do now? Um, Okay, so, so I claim that the moment you have said this, um, so the, the slight difference is that now this is already a non-abelian group instead of the group of translations. So before that, I formulated everything in terms of, you know, how much do we move things to the right, and now I want to formulate everything in terms of connections with this uh, structure group. So... So to define the morphism space, space between, so I have two of my Lagrangian submanifolds, okay? And again, I mean, the principle is still the same. I move the first one to the right. So we use, <coughs> just I'm gonna use a time-dependent uh, uh, affine transformation, dt. So this is, just think of it as a one form with values in this the V algebra here, um, such that a parallel transport maps. Um, so let's see, I'm going to make a picture here. Okay, well, this is the upper half plane. That's L0, and there's some lambda 0, but this is, okay, this is L1, there's some lambda 1 in R, where they approach the boundary, max lambda zero to a point bigger than lambda. Okay? And then, so you, you, know, you use these <coughs> as a guide for how to make Hamiltonian vector fields, which are just essentially lifts of those uh, things. Okay. So I claim that this, the, the, that seems to, it seems sort of a, it's an extremely minimal change from what we had before, instead of translation, some line translation and rescaling. But all the figures they suddenly will disappear. OK? 
Okay. So, um, so now let's look at, at the surfaces that define defining composition operations. Composition operation. Operations. Okay. So you have this surface here. And um, so every boundary component well, would be, come with a Lagrangian, but really the only thing that you want is you want to remember those numbers. And uh, so this is my surface S, and it should come now with a connection with values in this group, G, F, F, okay. Uh, I want the connection to be flat, so that locally the, the equation is kind of standard, F, A is equals minus D, A plus zero and uh, um, so this is a condition then you know uh, parallel transport along boundary components components preserves the lambda k by which I mean you know the parallel transport on this boundary component is uh, I find automorphisms that preserve that particular point on the real line, lambda zero. Okay? And then the, the space, oh, and we also have this, the usual asymptotic conditions as before. So here, you, know, you fix what they are. Okay? This space of such A is contracted. Okay? Uh, forgiven, forgiven. Forgiving behavior on the end. Okay, so this means that now you can define your morphism spaces using something, and you no longer have the problem as before. You can make a product map that um, that just gets you back into the original morphism space without inverting anything. <coughs> um, so you know, by the way, I, you'll, you'll realize that I'm giving an entire talk so far about uh, flat connections on a simply connected space. Okay, so this is not actually terribly surprising, but still, you know, okay, let me show you. So for example, okay, so the thing that we, before we, we kind of failed to construct, okay, and let's suppose we have a product and it's always the same that runs itself and fault involved, so let's suppose that we have lambda 0 equals 0, lambda 1 equals 0. Well, just all the lambdas are 0. So 0, 0, 0. Okay. And then, so our connection is supposed to have certain uh, um, parallel transport maps, which I will draw. So if you take parallel transport map from here to here, it's going to map uh, W goes to W plus 1. That's the FI transformation. And the same thing here. And here you're supposed to have W goes to W. And uh, the way that you solve this is that, you know, on this line here, the connection has to preserve the point zero, which means that it can only be a, a, a radial expansion. So over here, you make tran parallel transport to be equal W goes to <coughs> W. And here, it's trivial. And here, it's W goes to half W, OK? And I think you'll probably agree with me that if you double a number, and then you add two, and you half it, that's the same as adding one to that number. Um, but so I use the sort of non-abelian nature to trick, and so, no, so that gives you a very straightforward definition of the Fukaya category. You know, you have to, you have this choice of connection, tells you exactly which equation to write down for the composition maps, but there are no inversions of quasi isomorphs. Okay, so now, however, the thing that I'm more attached to is uh, the closed open string map, right? And so the closed open string map should be defined in a similarly transparent way using surfaces with an interior puncture um, and without playing around. Now, okay, so um, if you looked at it carefully, what happened before, and especially if you looked at Habuzai and Kinatra and other people, you'll realize that. Um, this idea that we still maintain that there's sort of a preferred direction at infinity um, is not a good idea for defining closed open string maps. Okay? So, um, 
So in fact, it's impossible to define a closed open string map in this framework here. But you remember that I sort of somehow unjustifiably used um, only a piece of the isometry group of the upper half plane. So, so to define to define uh, the uh, closed open map, we use uh, the entire G. Okay. Okay. So that seems uh, pretty natural. Okay. Um, the problem is that you know before that I said you know the the Lagrangian sub manifolds are going to approach a point on the real line, uh, but that is actually no longer G invariant as a condition, right? Because that the before that I secretly you know took the point of infinity out. So, um, so that um, this one here be the circle at infinity. Um, and uh, so let's say, so we identify it with something. So now, so I mean, the, the problem is, so, so I'm going to allow my Lagrangian sub manifolds to go. By the way, if you, in your mind, you want to switch from the upper half play model to the unit disk model, feel free, but I'm not going to bother. So, uh, so now I'm going to allow my Lagrangian sub manifolds to approach any point at the circle at infinity, okay? which is a little bit of a, an issue when you think about finding the morphism space. So if this is, you know, before that, I have these things go here, and I move the first one to the right. So now, you know, exactly how far am I supposed to move? You know, if I have two that go to infinity in the same direction, I move a little bit, but, you know. So, uh, but uh, the, the universal cover takes care of that. Okay. Um, so. So, uh, I'll run to seven manifold satisfy. Union, a half geodesic in the hyperbolic half geodesic uh, approaching so, point lambda in the boundary, uh, and we additionally fix some pre match lambda tilde. Um, in. Okay, they always come with some pre-image, which remembers how far we're supposed to rotate. So, okay, so now to define the morphism spaces between two such things, <laughs> and I use a, a connection with, with the, the full Lie algebra here, and such an a parallel transport maps what? Sorry, are you saying that for every Lagrangian once and for all? Yes, for every Lagrangian like once and for all, I fix one of those things. And in fact, effectively, it will be if you change that thing by, by, by an integer, well, like pi times an integer, that will be the same thing as having, you know, taken the Lagrangian and isotoped it once around at infinity. Okay, so that's part of the structure, and you'll see it right here. Such an A parallel transport. So this parallel transport map uh, leads to, uh, you know, it acts on the circle of infinity and its universal cover. So it maps. Lambda zero to a point in <coughs> so it's to the right of lambda one but not too much. Okay. So that's the uh, uh, sorry, lambda zero tilde. Okay. So basically if you change lambda zero tilde by some integer, then that condition will force you to choose a different connection which wraps things more around. Okay, but this is kind of a it's nice, it's symmetric under the entire group. Okay, now we look at the surfaces that define this thing, and uh, we have connections. They are G-valued connections. They are flat, parallel transport along the boundaries, preserves these points, uh, these limit points. And um, <coughs> so again, the space of such things is contractible. So that's just, I gave um, 
After this minor modification, so you get the definition of the Kai category, which is slightly more flexible than the previous one. And for this definition, you can actually define um, open closed maps. Okay, so now. Okay, so to define the open closed map, we look at. Okay, so we look at these surfaces here. <coughs> They're the same as before. Okay. Um, as before. Lambdas, number one, and so on. Um, and now I put in a uh, interior puncture. Actually, let me draw it as a circle so that I can draw something else. Maybe I will draw a mark point on the circle. Okay? And now there will be a condition. Now I will put in some, some monodromy here. And the monodromy, uh, okay, there'll be a condition here. Okay, so you start at this point and you go once around with this. And so the monodromy of A. A is a fixed um, hyperbolic element of G with rotation number one. Okay. And also, I need to say something. So the, the location this marker is a variable. Okay. Uh, I'll explain, sorry, I'll explain in just a second. And so then the space, the space of such A comma marker is contractible. Okay? So, now this, this result, now this, we're no longer talking about connections on a simply connected space. So in order to prove this lemma, you have to do the heroic deed of cutting it open along. So you, what, does, yes. what does it mean, rotation number one? Yes, I will explain it in just a second. Okay. Um, so, okay, sorry about this. I, I, I got the rest. Let me say something before I explain what, what rotation number one is. So this is where I'm going to recover my symplectic automorphism row. This is why this data is important. Okay. But before I go this, let me explain one thing about this statement here. Okay, sorry. So, so you choose the connection and the marker here at the same time, and then the space is contractible. Okay, and you might think, well, what do I care? Um, this is actually a crucial element that will tell you that the theory is correct. Okay, if you could specify the location of the marker freely. You could let it wander around in a circle, and then the open closed string map would be accompanied by another map of degree one less, which is given by this family where the marker wanders around. Now, for a Calabi Yau category, that's indeed true. The uh, closed Calabi Yau category, the open closed string map, is accompanied by its cousin, which is the open closed string map composed with the BV operator. But here, we cannot possibly have this. Okay? And indeed, if you try, to keep the marker fixed, just the space of such A is actually homotopy <coughs> equivalent to Z. So you kind of fail to fail to achieve this. I mean, you know, whenever you choose, in the end, this is a DQ of T, everything is supposed to depend on surfaces. So whatever additional structure you choose is supposed to be uh, a contract. Okay, now let me um, let me tell you about these uh, hyperbolic elements with rotation number one. Okay. Um, so, th so essentially, okay. So this is this is the entire definition of the open closed string map. You use these uh, use these uh, these connections to determine, you know, what, what Hamiltonians you use to define suitable equations, and then it, it really is that sort of, you know, I mean, this is what you expect the open closed string map to look like to be surfaces with an interior puncture. So, you know, uh, everything is uh, is sort of standard. So, okay, so. Um, Okay, I'm sorry, a hyperbolic element of yes. That's what you were trying to say, Thomas. No. Yeah. So the, the monodromy leads to the universal cover of G, yeah. right? Nice. So remember that G is a PSL2R. Okay. 
and G tilde, universal cover. Okay. And so G in G is hyperbolic. Um, if uh, plus minus the trace of G, well, so the absolute value of the trace, if there's obviously no trace, is greater than 2. Um, and so if, um, so every element of G tilde has a rotation number for hyperbolic elements, the rotation number is, uh, so rotation number, um, so you uh, fix a path from the identity um, to G in G and uh, watch uh, how any eigenvector of G uh, rotates. Okay, so the eigenvectors are on eigenvectors are element of RP one, but also for us this down here infinity. Okay, so basically, so if you take so a hyperbolic element is you know what you think. Uh, it's the simplest way to make, so this path corresponds to, you know, rotation number is something that's an element of G tilde, so an element of G tilde is the same as an element of G plus a homotopy plus a path. So the simplest way to get things in G tilde would be to, you know, take a one parameter subgroup, but all of those have rotation number zero, okay? So if you want to get a rotation number one element, um, so rotation number one, Let's say you do something like this. You take a full rotation. Remember we are in PSL, so that's, that counts as a full rotation. And I compose it with something that's a slight expansion. So e to the epsilon t, zero, e to the minus epsilon t, okay? For t is over one. Then for t equals one, we have rotation. <coughs> okay. Well, what I said here is, you know, you have a hyperbolic element, hyperbolic element has two eigenvectors. Uh, if you take a pass from the identity to, to that element, you start with that eigenvector, you'll get back to the eigenvector and just count the winding number around the circle. Okay. That's how it's defined. So, so what I want here is something that has rotation number one. Okay. And in fact, if you look at what I said here, of course, you could do it, uh, this only depends on the homotopy class. You could do it in many different ways. Let's say you could first do the full rotation, and then afterwards and stop here in time one, and then afterwards slowly do this one here. Okay? So, so when such a path here, this kind of path, is lifted to the automorphism group of E, So there's no unique lift, I should say, but you know, I mean, <clears throat> this is given by some time-dependent vector field on the upper half plane, and uh, you know, at infinity there's, a, there's an obvious lift of this to, to Hamiltonian automorphisms of your space E, and then you, could, you extend it over the interior in whichever way you want. Okay, so that gives you a flow. Um, we get time one map, time one map, map is exactly um, <coughs> this kind of flow. Okay, so we rotate it all the way once around, and then I did this thing here, which acts uh, on the upper half plane like a radial expansion, which you know that replaces my previous translation that goes up. Okay, exactly a row. So uh, okay, um, so. Uh, you can say, well, I, you know, this is rather strange. I would have thought yeah, we would have rotation number zero here. No, because rotation number zero is what gives rise to Hochschild homology, and uh, it's a different problem. <coughs> the homology of this case will be different because Hochschild homology will carry a BD operator. So this one works only with rotation number one. Um, why should I think um, so? So note. Um, 
So why should I think of this? Um, why am I allowed to think of this uh, automorphism, this, this kind of circle with this hyperbolic rotation number one, um, as uh, you know some kind of identity map, something that should carry a ring structure? Okay, so there is a so essentially unique. So if you take a surface like this, right, such that here it's a, on each boundary component it's a hyperbolic of rotation number one. So well, more precisely, if you fix fix what you want the the, the hyperbolic rotation number one monodromy to be on the boundary. Um, then, uh, well, exactly, you have to let the markers move as usual. Then there's a unique flat connection. In fact, these flat connections are very well known because they're exactly the flat connections that you get from hyperbolic structures on these surfaces. Okay? So, the, the, um, and so if you wanted to show, for instance, that the closed open map is uh, compatible with the ring structure, so this is the closed surface that defines uh, the, the product on, on the uh, closed string group, the fixed point flow homology of rho. So you take that surface, uh, you glue it into this end here, you get something which has two holes, and uh, essentially all you have to do is um, show that the corresponding space is here with two holes, uh, uh, and Marcus is still contractible, and then you can apply the standard TQFT argument where I take the two holes, I pull them apart, and I prove that you get actually the product uh, on, on motion cohomology. Um, which I'm sorry, I haven't done because I was kind of lazy, but I'm in the middle of this. Um, um, so, uh, yeah, so, You know, there's a whole family of these kinds of results proving that, um, you know, this flow cohomology of rho, uh, proving using this thing here, which means using contractibility of various, you know, Teichmuller spaces of flat connections, um, that these uh, spaces, um, H star of rho, have exactly all the structures, including sort of, you know, higher operations that you expect Hochschild cohomology to have, as, and nothing else. Okay, so uh, I am done. Um, given the time, maybe we should take questions during break. Yeah. Okay, and um, it's uh, ten minutes. Actually, I'm early. Oh, wait, you're early. Yeah. You're so early. so shocking. You're yeah. so early. Wow. Okay, in that case, open the floor to questions, please. <laughs> or not. <laughs> okay. Anyway, let's thank Paul again. <laughs> Completely missed that. Thank you. Well, the closed string is actually written. Yes, this, there's a paper which is intimidating part of Kyle Kennedy's Collections Equations 4, which has all the things about closed string operations, the blue brackets, and it also has, you know, for instance, the higher analogs of functional homology, so natural transformations for the powers of the cell Ah, that was my question. Yeah, so they have, they have very interesting operations, which you can see here, so they have. There, there are, there's of course a product structure, but there's also a Lee structure. Yeah, yes, but over Q. But it's not over at the level of the which is not laid out in KP1. Yeah, it's not laid out in KP1. Yeah, it's not laid out in KP1. Yeah, it's not laid out in KP1.